All right, I believe we're recording. Yep, the little red dots there. And we were just talking about how 50% of you have done your second journal entry and 50% have not, right? And we already have our favorites now, as established by who's done their work and who hasn't. All right, I'm speaking for We don't actually choose favorites, right, Mr. Kerr? You don't have any favorites. Mm. Well, I definitely um, appreciate the people that have um, written in their journal twice. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, unit two, lesson one, functions and relations. Two words that we have yet to define. And this first page doesn't even address them. Uh, but we need to build up to those words. It requires some vocabulary. Um, Mr. Are, can you make it bigger? Yes, I can. Oh, thank you for saying that before we got way into it. Full width. So for those who use Cami and you wish it was larger when you open it up, that's the move right there. Full width. Just makes it the size of the screen. And currently I'm using F11 on my uh, Windows computer to um, full screen my, uh, my Cami document. So some, some shortcut keys um, out there to maybe make things easier for you in the future. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, unit two, lesson one, functions and relations. So a set. This is Contreras. When I say what a set is, do you think that you can just like nonchalantly just say the definition? Mm. I think that I can try and then probably get corrected, but that's okay. okay Cause trying and getting things wrong is better than not trying at all. And then never knowing. Yeah. So I think a set is a collection of things that, um, that you can consider as a group together as a, um, yeah, collection. Although group has a very special math definition. So I'm not sure if I want to use group. Yeah. For those who, it. For those who are interested, group, the concept of a group in math, very specific, great journal entry idea. Look it up. A set is a collection of things. You, you say that you're worried that it's going to be wrong, but you're like pretty on the nose. A collection of things. I'm going to give the things a, a formal math name called elements. So a collection of things called elements. And we've mentioned this word before, right? When we did inequalities, the answers were sets. We had um, infinitely large sets, you know, all the numbers between one and five, that's an infinite amount of numbers, but, but each of the numbers in that collection of numbers is an element of that set, right? So a collection of things called elements, plural. Um, well, I'll put a little parenthesis on the S because there's such thing as a singleton set that has one element. And there's also some sets that have no elements. So um, they get a special name too. They're called a null set or the empty set but a set is a collection of things called elements. There are two extra words I want to add to your definition. Um, Cause these things, it, a set is a collection of things called elements. Um, and let me think about how I want to add this to your definition. A collection of things called elements and uh, the, the elements are unordered. Right? We can have ordered sets, but that's a, that's a more niche definition. A set, you could, you could have a set of numbers, one, five, three, nine. Right? The numbers don't have to be ordered. And the elements are unordered and non-repeating. And so when we're dealing with a set, right, we're not going to have the set of one, 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 one. one. We're not going to have the set of multiple ones. The set is going to ha just have the element one. Right. There are other things, maybe a sequence or something called a series where you do see elements repeat themselves. Right. But what we're looking at a set is just a collection of things where those things are unordered. Maybe they're ordered, but they don't need to be ordered. And uh, we, we see each element um, at most once. All right, so an example of a set, we use the curly bracket. On your keyboard, it is um, just above and to the left of the enter key. If you're working once again on a um, Windows, I don't know what it would be on Mac. All right, so curly bracket. If you want to know exactly what it looks like, it's on your keyboard. And then we start listing the things. Right, this is this is called a um, roster method of listing. So maybe there's one in the set, maybe there's two, maybe there's negative three. Once again, I'm not necessarily ordering it. Um, and then Mrs. Contreras said things. So like it doesn't necessarily have to be a number. Like um, let's see if I can do this. Ooh, is that the Superman symbol? 
I used to know how to draw it like legit. Like, no, I can't, I, I'm not getting it. All right, but let's pretend like it's an excellently drawn Superman symbol. Mm -hmm. right, what do you yep. want to put in this set? Um, well, I mean, you have some DC, so we need some, we need some Marvel. Uh, it's like a W for Wakanda. I don't know what the W for Wakanda looks like. I'm about to draw like the Wonder Woman one. Oh yeah, that'll work too. Wait, but, but um, what's, the, what's the W for Wakanda look like? I don't think it's that. That looks like the Wonder Woman, right? I wish I knew what it, I can't recall what it looks like. Let's also throw like, let's throw a, a, a palm tree in here. Ooh, that's nice. I like I like palm trees. I have a coconut. All right, cool. So this is a set. It's a collection of things. It's a very abstract idea. And um, if you pursue math as maybe a major in college, um, you'll look at these more abstract sets. But we are going to, in this class and in calculus, because calculus in this class are very focused on the real numbers, we're going to look at uh, the, the, the real numbers and the subsets of the real numbers. So from here on out, for the most part, we're going to be looking at sets with only numbers as their elements. All right, so you've, met, you've seen a lot of these. Let's formally define them. So the natural numbers, I'm going to use that curly bracket again. But the natural numbers, and actually before I do that curly bracket, let me uh, give you guys the symbol for the natural numbers. It's a bold N. Natural that numbers. bold. Makes yeah, it this is like a sneaky way. It's called blackboard bold. Um, but but, but this, this N is often the term that we use. You give yourself an N and then add a little bit of depth to it to differentiate it from just the capital letter N. Right. This fancy written in is specifically the natural numbers. The natural numbers are, how do you feel about zero? I don't know how I feel about zero. I think that we, we could argue that we include zero. We could also argue that we don't include zero. Like I grew up thinking that the natural numbers started at one because we also had this idea of whole numbers. But if we're not thinking about that, then I think including zero is okay in the natural numbers. Let's just not include it because as, as what you're saying, it's like um, just you, what you learned was it wasn't. It's, it's, a, it's a topic of debate, I guess we could say. And um, here's another idea for a uh, journal entry. Talk to us about why you think zero is or is not a natural number. And does it make a difference? That it is maybe get a little bit philosophical? Do, it, do what you want there. Mm -hmm. All right, so there are, there are natural numbers. One, two, three, four, the counting numbers. All right, um, the integers. All right, how do you want to, well, what are the integers? Here's the symbol for it. It's not an I. It's a blackboard bold Z. Why is it a Z, Mr. Kirk? So, like, I actually know the answer to this, but I don't know how to spell it. It's, it's a German word, Z-A-H-L-E-N. It's like an old German word, and it means to count. Oh. So, uh, which is fine, kind of weird because I'd consider the natural numbers the counting numbers, but but the integers, okay. All right, what are the integers? Well, the integers also include the negatives of what the natural numbers are, and I think we should also include zero in there. And notice I am ordering these. Like, it, it is valid to order sets. Once again, it's just not necessary, but I'm going to do it because that that kind of makes sense here to order a set. And you are going to include uh, zero in this um, loose definition? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I think so, too. I, I, it's going to be useful. Once again, the reason why we define things in math is so that we can discuss in an academic way in the future more complicated issues. So having zero there will be useful. And one of those uses is right now, let's define the even numbers. And there's no fancy blackboard bold letter for the even numbers. So I'm just going to do this. That's a very bad attempt at a curly bracket. The evens. Oh, it's even, I see. <laughs> yeah, evens. All right, what are those going to be? And what I want to do this time is I want to use the integers to define the even numbers. Mm. Well, so I, any even number is just two times any of those integers that we have, right? Yeah, right? Two, four, six, eight. How do you feel about negative numbers being even? I think that's fine, yeah. I think that's fine. I think, I think if we say that even numbers are, sorry, negative numbers are even, that might be useful in the future when we're talking about, it allows us to talk about more numbers being even. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the even numbers are two times any number 
And then here's a new symbol. It's a bar. And I'm going to write up here that I, what I mean by this bar is such that. Right? So two times a number such that that number is an element of the integers. Right. This I think there's other a, symbols out there for the such that. I think that you can also use a colon if you so desire, but yeah, I think more typically the, the long bar. Yeah, it's kind of like this is the this is what's populating the set, and this is the rule for all of these um, ends in this uh, first half that's populating the set. So give me an integer three, the number that's going to populate the set six. Give me uh, an integer negative nine, the number that'll populate the set two times nine. I think, did I say negative nine or nine? Whatever, negative 18, whatever. And so this tells us how to then use this rule to populate the set, right? We're including zero, it looks like, because zero is an integer. Zero times two is zero. Is zero an even number? I don't know. How about let's leave that for the viewer to figure out and get back to us, right? Is zero an even number? But let's continue. The odd numbers. How can we define this in a similar way in this, what we call set builder notation? And we call it set builder because we're building a set with some sort of notation. It's good for infinite um, sets. All right, how can we use set builder notation to describe the odd numbers? Well, all of the odd numbers are just one away from all of the even numbers. So we could just say like 2n using your set builder notation, 2n plus one. Or minus one, I guess. Yeah. I like plus, um, though, because if we're going to use this for algebra, plus is just, in my opinion, a little bit better. Mm. If we're going to talk about, I don't know, I just like to use pluses. More as of much a positive person. Yeah, I think so. I think so. All right, so let's put that bar, okay. two and plus one, yeah. and then n is the what? The integers, right? Yeah, n is an integer. Yeah. So if it's defined very similarly, but uh, now we're saying that the odd numbers are any integer times two plus one. And that includes one, right? If we plug in zero, zero times two plus one is one. One's an odd number. Negative one's an odd number, right? The rational numbers. We are once again going to use something we've previously now defined to define this new thing, the rational numbers, right? And we could get real philosophical. How do we define the natural numbers in a more rigorous way? But we're not going to do that here, right? There are some interesting ways to talk about what the heck are the natural numbers, right? But the rational numbers. We do have a symbol for this. It's a Q with a little bar to kind of differentiate it from just the capital letter Q. And I believe the Q stands for quotient, but don't, don't quote me on that. No pun intended. <laughs> waka waka. All right, so the rational numbers, Q being, I think, quotient. Um, what's, what's that going to be? Well, that's going to be a ratio, right? Rational makes me think ratio. So something over something else. And those two some things, I think we can just make them integers. Yeah. So let's go ahead and say that a rational number is any ratio between numbers where those two numbers are integers. M and N are both going to be integers. Right? And sometimes there's this added um, requirement that M and M is in simplest form. So like is two divided by four a rational number? Well, that's really just one half. So you can add this little extra bit that it must be in simplest form. I'm not going to do that here uh, because it's not really necessary for what we're going to do. Can you close right. the curly bracket though? It's bothering me. I can. I was going to get to oh. it. I was going to get to it. I hadn't forgotten, despite what you might think. <laughs> All right. And before we get to the real numbers, I'm going to do a little bit of hand wavy, like these are the real numbers because defining the real numbers is like of quite a challenging task if you're going to do it very rigorously. So we're going to do it a little bit more hand wavy. And I'm going to tell you what's a real number uh, but not rational, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it like Q prime. This is me making up notation. This is not all of these are popular notation that are used all over the place. Q prime, like Optimus prime, right? This is going to be my set of, um, I'm going to call them irrational numbers. Tell me if I'm solving this wrong. Irrational. There's two R's, right? I think so. And, and what the irrational numbers are, are any number that cannot be expressed as a ratio between integers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Contreras, do you know any examples of these? Uh, well, I think pi is an irrational number. Um, I like uh, phi or phi, depending on how you feel like. 
pronouncing that. And that's yes, one plus root, root five 18. over two, right? Maybe. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Hopefully, uh, if we're wrong, tell us. Mm. What you are. E, E is irrational. Yeah, and, and, and we're going to study E later. And we'll study um, the fee a little bit too, but we'll spend a lot of time on E. Uh, the, um, the, uh, what's a good name for E? The, I don't know. E. Extraterrestrial. Uh, I don't know. One point. Uh, it's like seven something. Seven, one, eight, I believe. I feel like we're getting these numbers wrong and I'm really embarrassed. Okay. Hopefully we're right. <laughs> That's what um, calculators are for. Oh, there's um tau. Tau, which That's is That's Mr. Uh, Ostrander's favorite because it's two pi, but it's also it's six point two eight stuff. And Mr. Ostrander's birthday is is is, is June twenty eighth. Nice, mm -hmm. cool. I, know there are I remember his birthday. I don't know your birthday, Mr. Kirk. May twenty five. Send oh. the presents my way <laughs> in a year. Um, or in, in like nine months. So um, the reason why these are irrational is because they cannot be expressed as the ratio between integers. And the big thing that's screaming that these cannot be um, expressed as um, the ratio between integers is the fact that their decimals are non-repeating. Like if I had 1.11111, 1 while it goes on forever, that can be expressed as a ratio between numbers. I think it's um, 11 over... 10? No, definitely not 11 over 10. Maybe 11 over 9, something like that. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it's 9 over 8. Well, wow, I'm like really embarrassing my number sense today. But um, um, repeating decimals. And, and if you're interested in knowing why, we can make a video or you can come and see us during office hours. But if you're interested to know why repeating decimals can be written as rational numbers, let me know. But non-repeating decimals cannot be written as rational numbers. So uh, we have Q. And then we have this like evil Q, like a bizarro Superman to Superman. And the real numbers, all of this is just to define the real numbers, which we use a bold or a blackboard bold R. And the way I'm going to define it is all the numbers that are um, contained in the rationals or this new made up set, the irrationals. Put a little or there. And I'll close the bracket for Mrs. Contreras. Right? Okay. There are other numbers besides rational and irrational numbers that are in none of these sets. But we're not going to talk about those here. There's a cool number file video about that, though. Ooh. Maybe we'll link it. Maybe. maybe. Or maybe we'll let them Google it with yeah. the internet. And put, it, and put it in the journal for those who haven't done their second journal entry. Come on. All right, so let's continue. That was a lot of time spent on um, just some basic um, background stuff, but uh, I think there was good information shared here. So hopefully you learned something. Hopefully we um, reinforced something at least. All right, let's proceed. Let's get to the potentially new thing, right? A relation. And a relation requires that we have previously defined sets, which is why we just spent time on that, right? A relation is a set of ordered pairs ordered pairs um, where the first and I'm going to ordered um, set of yeah where the first coordinate in the pair which is often regarded as the x coordinate the first coordinate is um, a domain value we'll define domain and range a little later and the second is the range value. All right, so two uh, quick vocabulary words that we'll get to in a second, but the big thing here is a relation is just a set of ordered pairs. All right, we have some examples here. Two, five, one, three, five, six. This set is not, does not have the number two in it, right? Saying, that, saying a set has the number two in it would say that the element two is in this set, but there's no two in this set. This is an entire single element, two comma five, right? This is its own element. This is its own element. There are three elements in this set and they are the concept of a ordered pair. Right? So a relation is a set of ordered pairs. This one has three, this one has, it looks like four, this one has four, right? 
Um, the key with a relation is there is a relationship. Two is being related to five. One is being related to three. Five is being related to six. That's where that word relation comes from. Right? Why do we care about relations? It allows us to develop the idea of a function. So before we get to that, let me give myself um, some bubble diagrams to further explain what a relationship is, a relation. So that was a terrible bubble. Sometimes I'd like to make my bubbles. All more bubbles fun. are terrible. Ugh. All right, here's here 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 are two sets. Mm, very blobby. Right? They're very blobby. Right? Two, one, and five are in this set. And we call this set the domain. Right? This set over here, we're gonna have five, three, and six in it. Doesn't matter where there are, it's unordered. This is our range. And what we're doing is we are looking at the relationship between these two sets. Right? Two is being paired with five. Right? You, you, want, you might want to think about it as like a machine. Right? When, when two is plugged in, you are telling the machine to think about the number five. Right? Five is related to six. And one is related to three. This is a relation. Um, I could do it with these other two. Let me think about it. Um, well, actually, yeah, let's look at these real quick. All right, we'll do them a little bit less um, obnoxiously. Here are two sets. That's the blobby. That's a, I'm very unhappy with that oval. But here we have three, six, negative one, and three again. So I, in, in this set, in my domain set, I'm not going to write three twice. Because this is its own set. Three is an element of it in the domain set. Here's my range. What do I have in it? I have an eight. I have a seven. I have a five. And I have a zero. Right? And this relation, this set of coordinate pairs, is telling me the following um, instructions. Take three and associate it with eight. Also take three and associate it with zero. Take six, associate it with seven and take negative one and associate with five. Notice that in a relation, it doesn't really matter if something goes to something twice. That's valid. And with this last one, you might actually be able to tell what the relationship is. Like sometimes there's a, there's a rule. Two, let me get my bubbles. We have two, they look like eyeballs. Two, negative two, three, negative three. Two is being sent to four. Negative two is being sent to four. And I shouldn't be writing four twice, sorry. Three is being sent to nine and negative three is being sent to nine. Okay. So the first two don't, don't obviously have a rule associated with them, but can you tell what rule is happening here? Yeah, I think it looks like, uh, like your domain values are getting squared to get your range values. Yeah, so we have some sort of rule happening. I'm gonna call that rule F. I could call it any letter I wanted. And what this rule is doing is it's, it's taking um, the domain value and it's applying the rule square that domain value. And then it's giving you a range value. Okay. Two goes to four, negative two goes to four. That's because there's this, this rule happening. So sometimes you can identify a rule, sometimes you can't. We will be concerned with, um, with relations of which you can define a rule. All right, continuing. We have these two things. I've already described what the, they are. The domain of a relation is the first number in each ordered pair. Um, if we're talking about graphs, it's the x coordinate. Uh, the range is the y coordinate. It is the second value. Or maybe we could generalize it to horizontal versus vertical. Yeah, that works too. Yeah. So we have like a, a horizontal axis, a vertical axis. And this picture right here is telling you exactly, exactly a relationship. These are all coordinate pairs just graphically expressed right this is three comma four right it's telling you that there's a relationship between the numbers three and four right um this one is what is that that's going to be i believe negative eight comma one two three four five six seven right this one over here it's four five five comma seven right notice that seven is being matched to twice by two different numbers like that's allowed in a relation Right. Um, what's the domain of this thing? 
Well, it'll be the set of all of the um, the horizontal axis, or in this case, the x-axis values that we have, which is what? Negative, negative eight. eight. Negative six. Negative three. This is like an eye test. Uh, mm -hmm. Negative one. Zero. Three. Five and seven, I think. Five and seven. See? Now I'm going to put the curly little, the terribly drawn curly brackets around this. Right? And the range here, same thing. Right? And notice I've ordered it. We don't have to order it. Like I could go, I could drive Mrs. Contreras insane right now and go one, negative one, negative seven, negative five, okay. um, seven only once, uh, four, negative and two. negative two. Right? It doesn't really matter. All right, there go, there they go, go the puppers. Um, we're not going to do the second one. That's a, if you want to exercise what you've understood so far, you can go ahead and do the second one. Um, you'll have access to this a blank version of this document. Um, but yeah, so so we have the domain, we have the range. The domain are those first coordinates um, in the coordinate pair, and the range is the second coordinate in the coordinate pair. And sometimes there's rules, sometimes there's not. It doesn't look like there's a rule here. All right, what we really care about and what this, this, a lot of this entire pre-calculus course is going to um, um, focus on are functions. We're gonna look at your standard functions that you may have learned before, x squared, x cubed, excuse me. We're gonna look, about, look at trigonom trigonometric functions. We're gonna look at polar functions. We're gonna look at complex functions. We're gonna be looking at tons of functions all year. So we need to know the definition of a function. And a function is a relation with an added rule. A relation such that, that's a weird S, a relation such that um, every domain value maps to a unique range value. Not val, val, u. All right, if I stroll back up and look at those previous, um, those previous relations that we looked at before, this first one is a function. When I, when I think of the number two, it gets sent to five, right? It doesn't get sent to multiple things. I like to think about it as like a vending machine. You click a button on the vending machine and you know what you're gonna get. If you don't know what you're gonna get, it's not a function. Like five goes to six. If I tell the vending machine one, it goes to three. The second one, there's some funny business happening. If I click three on the vending machine, I don't know if I'm going to get an eight or a zero, which is like a huge problem for me because I have really strong opinions about soda. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I, like, I'm one of those people that when I go to a restaurant and they say, is Pepsi okay? I say, no, I'd like something different. I'm one of those. What's your, what's your backup? If you're like, oh, can I have a Coke? And then they say, no, is Pepsi okay? Well, the problem is if they don't have, if they don't have Coke, they have Pepsi products, which is like, is, is Mountain Dew a Pepsi product? I actually don't know. But would you just it say is. like, no, I'll take water. I'll take water. Yeah. yeah. Or lemonade. <laughs> I'll take any, any, any brand lemonade I'm cool with. <laughs> but um, Pepsi, that's a no go. It's flat. It's like a little bit too sweet. I'm not a fan. I'm, I'm a Coke all the way. Very strong opinions. Hey, what's your favorite soda? I think I do like, Speaking I like soda, Cheerwine. Dr. Cheerwine is very nice. It's like a South, or North Carolina specialty. Cheerwine floats very tasty. It's like a, mm -hmm. a root beer float, but like better because it also like turns bright red. It's really I do, root beer is really good. I feel like I could go with any root beer. I don't have strong mm -hmm. opinions about what my root beer is. I mean, I has there's, strong opinions, though. there's like distinct differences in the root beers. But like they're all good though. I mean, root beers are different. You know, that, that's the cool thing about root beers. No matter which, like, where you get your root beer is like a big deal. Mm. There are places that make their own root beer. Really? Mm hmm. That's There's a cool. place in, uh, in um, Laurel called uh, BJ's that make their own root beer. Wow. Oh, it's a national chain. Oh, that's a little bit disappointing. Anyways, let's continue. <laughs> So we have a relation and, and then a function is like this vending machine. You click a button and you know what you're going to get, right? If there's any, um, if there's any discrepancy in what's being output, right? We often think of the range as the output values. 
um, then it's not a function. So we're going to be looking at lots of functions and we need to know when they are functions and when they're not functions. So here are some examples, right? Um, and we don't necessarily need to do these, but we'll just do them really quick, just to like hammer home the idea because these are, uh, are going to be similar to the ones we did on the previous page. But like I have domain, I have three, two, and eight. I have a range seven, three, and seven. I'm just going to write seven and three because once again, a set is um, a unique Right. If it wasn't unique, I would be deceived if I put two sevens and I mapped my three and my eight to two different sevens. I might think it's a function. Oh, sorry. This ends up being a function, my bad. Um, but I want to keep my, I keep my, uh, my sets um, unique. So we got three goes to, and I th yeah, three goes to seven. Two goes to three. And eight goes to seven. Oh, no. Is this not a function? I think it's still okay because we don't have like eight mapping to two different things. Like when you hit the eight button, you know you're going to get a seven. And when you hit the three button, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a seven. It happens with the same thing, but that's okay. Yep, this is a function. Excellent. Is that a we? That is a we, yes. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote it. It just fell out of my brain. All right, so <laughs> we, got, we got this function here. All right, is this a function? We got two. We got three, we got five, we got two again. All right, red flag. Red flag. And I'm just gonna go. Just like, why not? And then we got a six, seven, 16, and 11. All right, two is going to six. All right, three is going to seven. Five is going to 16. And two is also going to 11, All right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if 11 was Pepsi. Imagine if six was Coke and you like me prefer the, uh, the, the superior brand of cola. Mm. You'd be my, you'd be, be, be significantly angry if you clicked the two and a Pepsi came out. Like, this is not a function. Bummer. Or we want things to be functions because then we can work with them. Then we can anticipate things and we can, uh, we can better understand them. If something's not a function, then, then we might struggle to understand it. So we want, we want to work with functions. Right? We, want, we want inputs and outputs that we can predict. Much of math is about modeling um, predictions. Right? Like if you're doing physics and you want to know how something, a projectile is moving, like we, want, we don't want the, the missile or ball or whatever to be going like this and then all of a sudden like pop up here. Right? Well, that might be cool, but that, that doesn't happen in real life. We want to model real life situations with math and so we want functions. All right, so um, here is a, uh, a relation. It's certainly a relation, right? This, uh, I see uh, dots, and those are associating an input and an output. All right, but is this relation a function? Mm. Well, because a function means that we have a unique output for every input. Yeah, so if I look so, at this point right here, or let me, let me not use necessarily that color, but if I look at the uh, x value of 5, Right. How many y values are associated with it? Just one. Just one, right? All right. And what I can do is I can let's scan the whole. Uh oh. I'm gonna go ahead and pause and get my charger. All right. What was also good is we're back. Um, I we 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 are transporting ourselves from New Jersey to Maryland, and we have to feed our sourdough starter. So we remember that. Keanu Reeves lives to see another day. That's okay. The name of your sourdough starter? That is the name of my sourdough starter. Mine's mine's name is Bubble Sore. Bubble Sore? That is so much. No, I don't want to say it's better than Keanu. You didn't hear that. Keanu can hear. Um, Bubble Sore is a wonderful name. If anyone out there can think of other good bread or like yeast or, or or just funny puns that also involve Pokemon, let me know because I'd be interested in maybe making a new starter with that name. Okay, uh, back to what we were doing. All right, so five, it's only associated with one thing. How about like negative four? That looks like it's only associated with one thing as well. Um, right, I'm going to sweep interesting. up. I'm going to sweep down. Or something. Yeah, there's only one thing there. Right? But, but there's only one point there, right? Like, what, what's happening at that point, I don't really care. 
But what's important is the value negative four only has one value associated with it. Um, how can we um, make this idea of sweeping up and down a little bit more quick, efficient? Do you know something that we can do? We could take some sort of like vertical line. Right, and I wish I could like, normally I would take like my pen, my pen or my, my, my uh, ruler and swipe, sweep it across the, the graph. But, but we can do something called the vertical line test where we sweep a vertical line across our graph. And if there is never a point at which that vertical line touches two points, we are a function, you're good to go. And the problem I have with this is that when we introduce this idea of the vertical line test, when many students are introduced to it, they then boil down the definition of a function to the vertical line test, which is like a huge, <laughs> it's, a really huge, big red it's a really flag. big red flag because the vertical line test is not the definition of a function. A function says in two sets, this is why we're getting very specific about our definition. In two sets, one thing is mapped to a specific thing, a specific thing, thing in the range and the output. We're going to, we, we use those words synonymously, um, output range. Um, but, but you are going to learn about in the future other graphs that are functions. Um, I don't have any space here on this page, but, but maybe I could do it over here in the margins. But uh, this here, this spiral, it totally fails the vertical line test. Right? But depending on how you look at it, it might be a function. Right? Maybe you're thinking, hey, your angle from the um, positive x-axis then tells you a distance to go away from the origin. Right? We have an angle then that tells you a radius. Right? That, that, that's just, I'm associating one value with another value. Right? And if I continue to do that, like if I go 360 degrees, I get here. If I go 540 degrees, I get, I believe right here. Maybe it's telling me to go out two circles instead of just one. Right? This is a name, it's called a polar graph. Right? But we are going to study different functions that break the vertical line test. So please don't walk away from this video thinking the vertical line test is the definition of a function, it's not. But with what we're gonna do for the next few weeks, we're specifically going to be looking at the Cartesian plane where our domain is the X and our range is the Y, right? The, the, these two points, these two, uh, lines, they don't have to be the domain and range, but they are in a lot of our examples in the coming weeks. So, so we can use the vertical line test now, but don't get used to using the vertical line test. Rather, know the definition of a function. One, every domain value maps to a specific range value, right? So um, the domain of this thing, what does it look like? Uh, it looks like it's all the numbers that we have between whatever that endpoint is in the end of our graph. I think it's like negative eight. I usually have graphs from negative 10 to 10. I believe okay. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, three. So negative eight to two? No, because we also have, we're, we have our function is, or we have our, yeah, we have our function is defined at x equals two, right? So then yes. we can. So we keep going, right? Keep, yeah. And then, um, uh oh, here, there go the dogs again. Let me go ahead and pause it again. Sorry about this. It's still recording. This is, I paused it though. Oh no, I re <laughs> All right, we're back. Clearly I'm the awkward one of, of this group of two people. All right, so we're back. Uh, we have negative eight to two, but we, we include two, so we continue. And then just so everyone knows in the future, the graphs that we supply you, if there's no dot, I want you to know that that implies that it continues. So this is going to continue, right? It just has to do with the graphing software, right? These continue, right? If I wanted them, them to cease, I'd put a dot there. It just ha happens to be the graphing software. All right, so negative eight to infinity, right? Infinity. How are right. you gonna write your infinity, Mr. Kirk? I just did two circles. Oh, I'm not seeing anything. You're not? Oh, mm -hmm. I, oh, uh-oh. Sorry, oh, class. We are we are learning. Did you see all this up here? Uh, yes, the polar stuff, the uh, okay, Archimedes cool. spiral. Yeah, sweet, awesome, cool. 
Uh, so yeah, so I'm. We are learning. We are those two old people learning how to use technology for the first time. Very old. Yeah. But um, all right. So the range is all the y values that we hit. So we're going up. Uh, how do you feel about saying negative seven to um, five? Um, I feel very strongly that is not what we want to do. Okay. Because uh, look, that like what uh, like for what input can I get out? three like y equals three when would that ever happen i don't see that yeah, it's so like I negative think, eight yeah you're right nothing gives me yeah. these numbers right here so then i would need negative seven yeah up to one and we can include one right because mm -hmm. that's still we'll there but then, and then union just what is that oh my gosh eyes one, five two, three, five thank you nice five and then how do you want to write five um well I think you could either do curly brackets around the five or square brackets around five. I'm not really sure if like those so both curly make brackets sense. both make sense. I agree. Definitely not parentheses around the five. That would just be mm -hmm. what we call the empty set, a set with nothing in it. Um, a fun way to write the empty set for sure. But I'm going to do the curly brackets just because when I deal with singleton sets, I'm going to use curly brackets. That's just my opinion. That's my uh, preference. Sorry. All right. Is this a function? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Every every value. It passes the vertical line test, um, and we're dealing with our domain being the x values and our range being the y values. That's not always the case, but here it is. All right, so this is yes, right? and we will leave this one. Let me get rid of that circle because you might be looking at it. We'll leave this one for you to tell us. And we'll put a question right here. Is this relation a function? And the answer is yes, it is. It is. You know, we don't. We, there's no value there at um, two. That's what we call a hole. Oops, a hole, and I'm totally spelling hole wrong. There's no W yeah, in that. Not how we write hole. Hole, that's a yeah, hole. Owl. And and this is kind of funny, but um, I had a student once who thought, in that circle, does it include all of the points you could fit in that circle? And my answer to him was no. It's only referring to that specific single coordinate. Two comma five. It's not excluding one point nine 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 five. It's not excluding two point zero 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 one comma five. It's just that one point. It's, the, it's this idea of a circle is removing that one point. We call it a removable point. All right. So that is a function. yes. Discontinuity. And we can, I think we can use that word. Yeah. I just was debating in my head if I wanted to say it or not, but we can. All right. Let's continue. Got one page left. We'll do this one. Uh, quick so that we don't hold everyone uh, too long in this video. One to one functions. All right, so it's a function. What must be true? It's uh, for every output, there's an input. Yep, so for every, so if, if, I have, if I have a set, one, two, three, every value goes to something specific. Like maybe one goes to three. Maybe two also goes to three. And maybe three goes to seven all right this would be a function but this is not a one-to-one -one function because what a one-to-one -one function requires not one-to-one -one, and sometimes we would write it like this not one-to-one -one, okay what a one-to-one -one function requires is um, a function obviously it's a function we have that word function there a function such that every range value and I'll put a slash output for those who like to rather use that word output. Every range value is associated with one domain value. It's almost like the reverse of a function in a way. Right? It, it, but it's still a function. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the reverse of a function, but, but it has this property that now we look at the range values and go backwards as well. Right? We have a problem. Three is coming from two different things. Right? Two goes to three, one goes to three. So a, a one-to-one -one function says, um, I have a Coke and I need to solve the mystery. What button was clicked? Right? In a one-to-one -one function, that, that's going to be solvable. Right? If, I, if I change this and say two goes to nine, I don't know, this is one-to-one. 
Because if I, if I go ahead and I say that nine is my Coke and seven is my Pepsi, and I ask you, hey, I have a Coke, which button did I click? Can you establish which button I clicked? Absolutely, you press number two. All right, that's a one-to-one -one function. And there's this word injective here, that's just a, a fancy math term, injective. It's a, it's a, it's a synonym for one-to-one. -one. You will see one-to-one -one much more often, uh, at least in this course. Um, a function such that every range value is associated with one domain value, right? So now, not only do we know what we're gonna get, once we have what we have, we know what we had clicked as well, if we're thinking about this, and once again, in that, in that uh, vending machine analogy. All right, um, here is a uh, fancy math symbol way to describe this, right? If f of a is equal to f of b, like if nine is equal to nine, then the things that gave you nine better be the same thing, right? So um, if, if I say, um, let, let me stop rambling. I, I don't think this works very well with what I previously said, right? but this is a fancy way to say it. It's just saying, if the outputs are the same, then the inputs must also be the same. So then is x squared, is that an injective function? Let's look at it. And I think this is a really good example of um, a, or a not injective function. I think this is a good um, thing to look at to, to understand what an injective function is, right? Give me a range value. Uh, nine. Nine. So, um, one, two, three, four, five. You know, give me a range value that I can fit on my little tiny graph here. Uh, one. <laughs> one. Okay, cool, 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 cool. All right, so I'm going to draw a horizontal line. Hint, hint. If you give me the number one, I, as like Sherlock Holmes, I need to figure out what number you put in the function to get one. And I believe there's two options here. There's Positive one. and negative one, yeah. You know, one, and, one and negative one, right? So you say, hey, I have a one. What did I plug into the function? And I say negative one, what do you say? I mean, you're being very negative, so I feel like I should be positive. Uh, yeah. Positive one. Oh, you, you put a, okay. So that is the idea here, is that a one-to-one -one function, we know what is being plugged in based on an output, right? And there are some advantages. Like uh, we've already seen some ex advantages, right? When I'm, s if I have like the square root of X is equal to negative nine and I square both sides and I get 81, right? The answer is not 81, right? What I'm doing is I'm doing a non one-to-one -one operation on this equation, right? Causing me to now have two possible inputs for my output. I need my output to be negative nine but now I have, I, I, I think I'm starting to lose my words, but, but I don't really know how to go backwards from 81 back to negative nine, because two things squared to get 81. So when I try to reverse my steps, I am unable to, because I do not know from, wh from where I came. And if I give you two X is equal to one, well, sorry, if I, if I have two X is equal to one and then I, I give you X is equal to one half, you might be able to know how to get back to, you might be able to know how to get back to what I had originally. Here, there's no way, right? I'm gonna stop with these, these elaborations. I don't think they're helping that much. Let me continue. Let's just do um, one quick example and then we'll have you guys do the second one and we'll close this out. All right, so um, is this graph here a one-to-one -one function? Are we looking at right or left? Left one, left one. Left? Are you, are no. you able to see me spinning? No. Oh, that's interesting. But you can see me writing now? Yeah. Interesting. So you cannot see my, uh, my mouse. Interesting. That's actually really good for me to know. All right, so the left one. The left one, no, because, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh my gosh, so much counting. It's like right. seven, y equals seven or so y equals seven yeah and we saw this one on the previous page right? you are mm -hmm. using some version of the horizontal line test which only works for functions that are um x versus y once again but it's valid here right? there are two um x values associated with the y value of seven what are they um negative eight and oh my gosh my eyes i believe it's five i'll give it to you there. all right cool and if it's not five whatever Right, two values are giving you that value of seven, which is not a function. This is, so is the relation function no? 
If so, is it one-to-one? Na. Like, like fun you might be able to think about a function, sorry, a relation as one-to-one or not. Um, but but that word uh, one-to-one is is a is a would it be an adjective of a function? Mm. Yeah, we use it for for to classify functions, not necessarily relations. Are there are there are other types of um, special types of functions. There's something called um, surjective, and there's something called bijective. Um, and feel free to look them up and see what they mean, and then try to interpret them, and maybe write about them in your journal or share them during uh, your breakout sessions. But um, no, we'll leave this one for you. Surjective. Spelling surjective is kind of hard. So onto is another way of uh, Googling that. That's true. Yeah, onto. And then bijective, I think, is just bijective, right? Yeah, because it's both yeah. of them together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bijective is just surjective and injective. Um, and, and bijective functions have their um, purpose, too. All right, so we're going to have you do this one right about now. And this one is... Um, oh, we made a mistake. Can you find out where the mistake is? We'll ask them first. Right, the mistake is right here. This is a function, isn't it? Uh, oh, yeah, it is. It is a function. Yes, but it's not one-to-one. -one. Over here, <laughs> hopefully we're not confusing the heck out of them. Over here, this is not a function because look, one is associated with two uh, range values. So this is no NA, All right. Um, C'est la vie. It is okay to make mistakes. Hopefully we didn't confuse anyone too much there. Okay. Um, but if you have questions, we'll always be available to answer them. All right, how are we gonna close this one out? Uh, we should do the um, Ms. Boulay and Mr. Colley sign out. Mm -hmm. So so like, so like, all right, time, time to get this. Wait, no, wait, first we have to sit for awkward, awkwardly for a few seconds. Did it stop? Yeah, no, not, not yet. And then, and then we need to realize that we forgot to stop it. Oh. And then we need to take a little bit longer than, than it's comfortable to stop.